Paracelsus was quite the curmudgeon, but he was also a brilliant man who developed the methods of evaporation, precipitation, and distillation to reduce matter to its purest form, and was thereby credited for adding zinc to what was then a short list of irreducible elements. Like any good alchemist, he was fond of combining things, and in 1520 Paracelsus dropped iron and sulfuric acid and called the gaseous substance produced an air which burst forth like the wind. It would be another two and a half centuries before the Frenchman Antoine Lavoisier proved this gas to be an element in its own right, which he named hydrogen, meaning water forming. About this time, ballooning had become all the rage. Three men in Paris filled theirs with the hydrogen they produced by pouring a ton of sulfuric acid on a ton of scrap iron. With Benjamin Franklin in attendance, it was released on August 23, 1783 and flew north for 45 minutes before landing in a small village. So terrifying the peasants living there, they attacked it with pitchforks. In 1800, two scientists discovered they could decompose water into its constituent gases using the newly invented battery. The process of electrolysis was a far easier way of creating hydrogen, and with a readily available supply, the Swiss inventor of Oz designed it, the first internal combustion engine in 1807 to run on it. His vehicle topped out at a blazing 3 miles per hour, making him the original land speed record title holder. The first practical fuel cell was demonstrated in 1839 and is for all intents the reverse of electrolysis. Many more breakthroughs were soon to follow, inspiring Jules Verne to write in his 1875 book, Mysterious Island, I believe that water will be employed as a fuel, that hydrogen and oxygen which constitute it, used singly or together, will furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light. And in 1920, a British scientist went so far as to boldly predict that it will one day be produced entirely by renewable means. It is an attractive concept for what could be more elegant than using natural energies to convert water into a fuel that turns back into water when burned. And perhaps we might have achieved a sustainable, cost-effective method of doing so by now. But then this happened. And then this which also gave hydrogen a bad name, but not nearly to the degree that the Hindenburg disaster did. It was one of the earliest and most horrendous spectacles ever captured on film, and much in the same way Three Mile Island and Chernobyl had demonized nuclear power. It shattered the public's confidence in the promise of a hydrogen-powered future. Hydrogen has nonetheless remained an indispensable commodity for the petroleum industry and for the production of essential chemicals such as fertilizer and methanol and its demand is expected to increase exponentially over the next 30 years. But more than 95% of that produced today is known as brown hydrogen, which is made by decomposing natural gas or coal using a highly endothermic process called steam reforming, and is responsible for emitting over a billion tons of carbon dioxide annually. But there has been of late a flurry of activity on a variety of fronts for making green hydrogen, such as using natural heat sources like concentrated solar energy to steam reform biomass. But the ultimate goal is to bypass hydrocarbons entirely to produce hydrogen directly. And the most promising of these methods involve either low or high temperature electrolysis, photoelectrochemistry, and solar thermal chemistry. On a side note, there has been some excitement over what the industry is calling solar paints, by which quantum solar dots, or in this example a combination of titanium oxide and molybdenum sulfide, catalyzes the splitting of moisture absorbed from the air. The efficiencies of current systems are still far too low for practical use, and there is the problem of collecting and compressing the low volume, highly volatile mixture of hydrogen and oxygen involved over a large surface area, though the concept does hold promise for the future. Low temperature electrolysis powered by solar panels is perhaps the most plug and play way to generate green hydrogen. The common silicon based solar panel utilizes only a fraction of the sunlight absorbed, however. The rest is converted to thermal energy and wasted as residual heat. And though there are multi junction cells made from exotic 3 5 materials like gallium and indium that have efficiencies as high as 40%, they are far too expensive for this purpose. The alkaline electrolyzer is a current standard on the market. It's favored in most industrial sectors for its efficiency and low cost. 
An alternative is the proton exchange membrane electrolyzer. They are about twice the price, but are even more efficient and do not suffer from the slow startup and cross diffusion of gases that alkaline electrolyzers experience due to fluctuating power sources, such as those outputted by solar panels on cloudy days. But there is a new player on the market, the anion exchange electrolyzer, which combines the best attributes of the other two and thus may soon relegate them both obsolete. Anion exchange is also fundamental to high temperature electrolysis. Steam is introduced on the cathode side, producing hydrogen and oxygen ions which pass through the ceramic membrane to the anode, where they are oxidized and released to the atmosphere. The durability of the cathode remains an issue, but the simplicity and efficiency of this method in addition to its lower power requirements compared to low temperature electrolysis may justify the expense of replacing it on a regular basis. The aforementioned solar paint is a branch of photoelectrochemistry, which is essentially an incorporation of the solar panel and electrolytic unit as one. In most cases, the anode serves as the photoabsorber to drive the oxygen half reaction, while the hydrogen is reduced to the cathode with the help of a platinum or ruthenium coating. An external potential is generally needed to sustain the reaction, limiting its efficiency to 10%. But there now is great work being done in developing cells that do not rely on precious metals, such as this one which uses a perovskite to produce hydrogen by the power of light alone. The lifetime of these materials, however, will need to be improved markedly before they can be considered viable for deployment on a commercial scale. Heat alone may be used to split water, but it takes 4,000 degrees to do it, and few materials can stand up to that. The barrier can be lowered using metal oxides. Here, cerium oxide is put through hot cold cycles. The input is only water. The output is only hydrogen and oxygen. 2,000 degrees C is still rather high, and there are alternatives such as cadmium oxide. Surprisingly few thermochemical candidates compete with cerium. Of them, copper chloride is among the most attractive due to a relatively low temperature needed, though some electrolysis is required, as well as materials that can withstand the highly corrosive conditions involved. It is unlikely that coupling photovoltaic systems with electrolyzers will ever meet the production target of less than $2 per kilogram of hydrogen produced. Its efficiency is too low, can only produce power during daylight hours, and requires the more expensive type proton exchange membrane electrolyzers. Solar concentrators gather much more of the sun's energy than do solar panels. There are a variety of mediums available for capturing this heat such as falling particles and supercritical gases. But the most commonly used are molten salts, which store it like a battery, enabling round-the-clock operation of a steam turbine for generating the steady power alkaline electrolyzers require and or provide thermal energy for any of the other emerging technologies I've outlined. But first and foremost, we must bring the heat. As explained in my other video, the heliostats and tower account for a majority of the capital needed for a CSP plant. Again, I contend that this may be reduced significantly by employing my design for a linear solar array. It should not only greatly lessen the cost per meter squared of reflected area, but allow for a much tighter focus on the target, perhaps increasing it as much as tenfold and by concentrating more heat or suns on a smaller receiver, a much less substantial tower will be needed to support it. I have several improvements in mind, but am always open for input and could really use the skill of a far better machinist than myself to construct the final version. I propose we partner in building a single string of say 15 4 foot square mirrors to demonstrate its ability to hold focus on an existing target and to better be able to estimate the cost of building a facility large enough to satisfy your green hydrogen needs. Lastly, we may even be able to qualify for a grant from the Solar Energy Technologies Office, especially with the renewed focus on the environment this new administration is bound to adopt. Thank you for listening.